Welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange Podcast. Stories by leaders for leaders to help you raise the bar on your own excellence to release the potential inside of you. Now, here's today's podcast. Greetings, everyone. This is Hugh Ballou. Welcome back to a new episode of the Nonprofit Exchange, where we talk to leaders and get their secrets to success, what they found worked, what didn't work, what's their wisdom. And um, each week, it's a different person from a different place with a different experience, but, but they have a passion for excellence. And so they, today's guest is the founder of a really neat networking group called BNI. And um, I'm gonna let him tell you a little bit about BNI. I've been a member over the years and I've done networking uh, as a nonprofit leader, as a church professional, and as a business professional. And I find out that networking is as misunderstood as leadership is. And so there's a whole lot more varieties of what people call networking. But Ivan Meisner stands alone as, as, as a person who uh, has, has developed a whole new system for networking. So, Ivan, welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange today. Hugh, thank you very much for having me here. I, I appreciate it. And um, you're right, I, I am the founder of BNI. We now have 9,500 groups in more than 70 countries around the world. Uh, but what you may not know about me is that uh, I, I have spent some time in the nonprofit uh, world. Uh, one of my first um, is, is my second management job was as um, a, a assistant to the president for a nonprofit uh, transportation business in Los Angeles uh, called uh, Commuter Transportation Services Inc., which was rideshare before there was Uber rideshare. It was you know computers bigger than this room to set up uh, rideshares. It was funded mostly by the government and by nonprofit uh, by. Uh, private uh, corporations funding the nonprofit. So I worked there for a while and I've been on the boards of nonprofit organizations for more than 30 years. So a lot of, a lot of experience in the nonprofit world. So you know some of the challenges um, that nonprofits are facing and, and today even more challenges. Yeah. So, so um, I like to say that um, um, in the words of my, my co-publisher of our magazine and friend, uh, Jeff McGee, um, we, we suck at networking. Suck is halfway to success. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I've stole that from him, but I give him attribution. Um, but we just, um, you know, we think, oh, we go in a crowded room and we say, hey, I need this. It looks like the stock market. We're trying to bid higher than the next person. But I found my experience in B&I to be uh, relationship building and also the people I met there, um, I still know. I'm not active in that anymore because there's, uh, I don't know, life has taken me different places. So I didn't purposely get out. I just moved. Um, no. But, but um, I found that it has, it's multidimensional. So let's go back. When did you found uh, BNI and why did you found it? I started BNI in January of 1985. I was a management consultant. I uh, helped companies with the hiring, training, evaluating employees. And uh, I needed, I, I got most of my business through referrals. And so I was looking for referrals, but I went to a lot of networking groups and, and there were these groups that I went to that were just, they were just plain mercenary. You know, I'd go to these meetings and I felt like I'd been slimed and I needed to go home and get a shower because everyone was trying to sell to me, right? Everyone was trying to sell and I didn't like those. Then I went to these other groups that were totally social. It was happy hour and hors d'oeuvres and nobody was doing business. And I didn't like either of those kinds of groups. I wanted the business, but I didn't want it to be mercenary. I wanted the social, but I wanted it to be relational. And so what I did was I merged this concept of business and relational. And the glue that would hold it together is our principal core value of giver's gain. This idea that if I help you, you'll help me, we'll all do better as a result. Now, Hugh, I'd like to tell you I had this vision of an international organization, but I just wanted some referrals for my consulting practice. And I wanted to help my friends. And one thing led to another and it turned into two to 10 to 20 groups. By the time it hit 20 groups, I realized, and it happened in less than a year, 
it hit me that I had struck a chord in the business community because we don't teach this in colleges and universities, even in business. So I, I get it that you nonprofit, you feel like you're not prepared, but business isn't prepared either. We don't teach this in school. And so it, that's when it hit me that we needed to teach this and we needed to provide a platform for business people. And we now have, like I said, 9,500 groups in more than 70 countries. 9,500 groups. How many countries? Se more than 70. We have people from a couple of countries here. We have um, um, Algeria and we have Texas. Those are different. Yeah, countries. Texas is its own country. That's right. Texas, California. We're in the South. We think California is another country, but we're, we're confused about Texas. <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 uh, I grew up in California. It is another country. <laughs> it's going to fall off in the ocean someday. So <clears throat> I, I, there's a, what my mission is, is to help nonprofit leaders think out of their box to learn some really good business principles. And sometimes in networking, we do the inverse. We don't want to ask anybody for anything or we come from a, a position of need. Oh, I need this. Uh, help us. So let's, let's tell me about the, the framing that, that nonprofit leaders, we have clergy, we have executive directors, we have board chairs, we have people in this, what, I, what we like to call the for purpose, not for profit, but for purpose community. So what's the mindset we need to have as we approach networking? So I think the first mindset, and it's something that I teach everyone, and I think uh, applies in the nonprofit world just as much as in the for-profit, and that is um, the foundation of networking is uh, something I call the VCP process. It stands for visibility, credibility, profitability. You first have to be visible. People have to know who you are and what you do. And then you move from visibility to credibility. And credibility is where people know who you are, they know what you do, they know you're good at it. That takes time, Hugh. It takes a long time to go from visibility to credibility. And then, but when you get to credibility, then you can move to profitability where people know who you are, they know what you do, they know you're good at it, and they're willing to refer people to you. They're willing to bring people to you. Whether it be a for-profit enterprise or a nonprofit enterprise, they're willing to refer you, support you, help you. And that, um, that takes time. Networking is much more about farming than it is about hunting. It's about cultivating relationships with other business professionals. And I think this fits the nonprofit world well, but I don't think the nonprofit world knows that. <laughs> they keep thinking, no, no, we're different, we're different. Well, the VCP process applies to both. Absolutely, we've, we've got this brilliance that we offer. We, we feed people, we clothe people, we help people get a job. We do all this philanthropic work. So that's our, our mental capital. And over here, we want financial capital, but there's a whole space in between where you do all of what you're talking about. It's relationship capital. That's social capital, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we, we, build, we build that. Um, it's relationship, it's trust, it's being social. And um, I don't care if you're an introvert or not, and it takes energy away from you, it's still important for the leader and the board. Now, tell us a little bit about your board experience. The board yeah. that you served, did you help them think about networking? Oh yeah, absolutely. But let's let's talk for a, a moment. You were saying, um, uh, you were talking about, um, before you asked about the board, you were talking about, um, uh, it just slipped me. Um, see all the gray hair, things are slipping my mind. <laughs> um, but yeah, I did, I did. I'll come back to that. It'll hit me while we're talking. Uh, but yeah, I've been on a number of boards. I've been, I, I'm an emeritus member of the, Board of uh, Directors for the Leroy Haynes Children's Center in, um, in the Los Angeles area. I was on their board for almost 20 years. Um, I um, have been on the Board of Trustees for the University of Laverne. I'm presently sitting on the Board of um, Directors for the Austin Boys and Girls Club. And um, I started my own foundation. So obviously um, I'm on the board of my own foundation. So. Uh, you know, I've had a lot of work in non the nonprofit world for uh, a long time, and, and the nonprofit world does a lot of really good work. Yeah, I was talking about trust and having a conversation, and it's a process to go from what we got to offer to people writing the check. Yeah, and so thank you. And so when you have that, um, there are a number of things that one can, oh, and you talked about introvert and extrovert. Yes. And that's the thing that um, I wanted to touch on. A lot of people assume that you have to be an extrovert to be a 
good at networking. <clears throat> and that's just not true. And what's really funny is, is absolutely true story. And I wrote about this about eight years ago on my blog, uh, IvanMeisner.com. I've got more than a thousand posts. I've been blogging there for more than 13 years. Um, and one day I was talking to my wife and the kids, we weren't quite empty, empty nesters. They were in high school and they were at some high school thing that was a practice of some kind and a drama. And, and so I, it's just my wife and I, it was like, this is great. This is, you know, this is what it's gonna be like when we're empty nesters. And I said something to her, I was like, oh, you know me, honey, I'm, a, I'm an extrovert. And she looks at me, she's like, mm, no, no, you're not. And I'm like, what do you mean I'm not? Of course I'm an extrovert. I run the world's largest business networking organization. I can't be an introvert. She, and then she says, I don't know, I, I've been married 32 years, Hugh. I don't know, I don't know if you're married or not, but, but this, is, this is so, you know, a husband-wife relationship. She's like, Okay, honey, if that's what you think, that's fine. You can be an intro. I'm like, no, no, it's not what I think. I, I'm, I'm a keynote speaker. I, I, you can't be an introvert. And she's like, hey, whatever you think. I'm like, How, why do you think I'm an introvert? So she said, well, I've been reading a book. And she starts telling me the characteristics between an introvert and an introvert and an extrovert. And I'm like, yeah, okay, that's a little like me. And then she said something, man, it hit me. She said, introverts, extroverts love to go out to recharge their batteries. Introverts, they want to hide. They want to get away from everybody. You know, maybe family, but get away from people. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that definitely sounds like me. But I am not an introvert. So I walk into my office at home, like we lived in California then, and I got on the internet and I found a test to take. Because I was going to show her I am not an introvert. And so I take this test, true story, true story. I take this test and, and it comes back and says, Congratulations, Ivan Meisner, you are an introvert who is a situational extrovert. And I looked further and it said, when you are talking about something that you are very knowledgeable about, when you're in your wheelhouse, when you're with close friends, you come across as an extrovert, otherwise you're an introvert. Now go apologize to your wife. Okay, didn't say that last part, but I did. I went and said, hey, I can't believe this, but you're right, uh, I'm, I'm an introvert. And so even before I discovered that, I told people introverts can be great at networking. And the reason why they can be is that, th that they're much more likely to listen than to speak. A good networker is like a good host, an interviewer. Hugh, you're asking me questions and you're letting me just answer. That's what a good networker is. Good networker asks questions and let the person speak. Now, extroverts love talking. What's their favorite subject? It's right. <laughs> it's themselves. So people assume that an extrovert is a great networker, but that, that's not true. They're a great networker if they've learned how to slow down and be an interviewer, ask questions just like you are. So take a note. Don't use don't use your personality type as an excuse. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> that's right. Sometimes you know Myers Briggs, uh, many of those instruments, uh, extra instrument. I'm way over on the E. But if I'm in a group where I'm not subject matter expert, I can flip well, over and I'm just quiet. Yeah. So I'm a situational introvert. That's a really good term. But it it really is about our processing and you know and our energy. So I gain energy. I'm a conductor. I'm, I finish a two-hour rehearsal. I'm just raring to go. I got all this adrenaline. Other people would be got to go to bed <laughs> when they're after you know have a social event or something. I'm I'm tired. Yeah. So that and also you're so true. When an introvert speaks, they plot it out and then they boom, it comes out as completion completed thought. Now extroverts, we just blurt it out. It's in process because our assumption is we're going to have a conversation. Now the Im important thing that Rose rose in your conversation in my attention was that we're talking to a potential donor the scenario you just described we're networking yeah. we want to listen to them what yeah. are they interested in we want to we want to go up to the atm and put in a card and get some cash well guess what they don't want to be an atm yeah. you want to find out what they're interested in that's a form of networking isn't it it is and sometimes you find out it's not a good fit but you want to find people that it's a good fit where their values and their vision on the impact that they want to make in their community is 
congruent, is resonant with yours. And where you can find those, those levers that you can pull that are resonant with their, their goals in life, the things they want to make a difference in, then you've got the right person. And, um, and, and you have to find out, you have to learn about that individual before you can start, you know, trying to pull money out of them. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and it's, it's really um, in, in business and in, and in the social benefit world with churches, nonprofits, synagogues, we receive money because we provide value. Yes. But isn't that the same in business? It's, it's all the same. People buy from us because we give them value. Yeah. And, and there's a trust level there. So there's, there's a monetary exchange. It's an exchange of energy trust. There's lots of ways to think of it. And, and so having conversations, you're so right. It, it's going to be 10% talking. It's like um, when I study coaching, a corporate coach, you, yeah, they said um, coaching is 90% listening and most of the other 10% is listening. <laughs> so <laughs> I've had clients that solve great problems and they've given me credit for it when I've been just a, a faithful yeah. listener. So, so. And, and, and I, asking questions. Yes. As a coach. Yes, absolutely. And then, and then listening actively. So yeah. we're, we're already, we might be nervous when we're going to approach a donor or in front of a group or a new network of people. Uh, so what's your advice to especially nonprofit leaders? Now, we do have a mix of people on here. Some people have a nonprofit and a business. Some people have a church and a business or a synagogue. Some people, you know, have only one or the other. But what's your advice for people as they're approaching, maybe let's say a new group opportunity to network with other professionals and we have some anxiety about apprehension or anxiety or concern about that what's your advice to get the right mindset as we go into an opportunity to meet new people so i think the right mindset is about um building relationships with people you know it's not as you said it's not about the transaction it's it's about the relationship and so i believe in one of my books i wrote something you might find um interesting in a book I wrote called Truth or Delusion, where I ask questions and I say, is this, is this statement, I ask a question or a statement, is this statement true or is it false? Is it a delusion? And one of the, one of the statements that we made in the book is that you can network anywhere, anytime, any place, even at a funeral. Is that truth or delusion? And of course, overwhelming majority of people say, oh, no, you cannot network at a funeral. So here's our answer. Our answer is that's actually, it's truth. It's not delusion, but here's the key. And this is really important. And so if you hear that answer, you gotta hear, you gotta hear this first sentence after that answer. And that is, you must always honor the event. So you don't go to a funeral passing out your business card. Oh, hey, does anybody need my business? You know, that's completely inappropriate. But if networking, as I believe it is, is about building relationships with people, then there's no place that is inappropriate to build a relationship. Let me give you an example. I was at a church function years ago, and there was a, a, a member of the church. There was one of the, you know, one of those uh, potluck things in the afternoon. Everybody brings in meals and a lot of fellowship, and people are talking. And and I um, saw a business guy who I really wanted to get to know. He was very successful in the area, and and I struck up a conversation with him. And um, one of the questions that I suggest that people ask, after you say, tell me about who, you know, who are you? you know, tell me about your business, what's your target market? What kind of clients are you looking for? All the normal stuff. One of the questions I like to ask is, but you can't start with this, you gotta end with this. What are some of the challenges that you run into in this business? And he, he gave me an answer I'd never heard before. He said, well, actually, the business is awesome right now. He said, my biggest challenge is that I wanna give back to the community. I wanna to give to the community, but sometimes my years are really up and some years are not up as much. You know, I'm always, I'm having good years one after another, but some are incredible. And so, but I don't wanna give away all that money. I wanna hold it back, but I'm not big enough to create my own foundation. So I don't know how to deal with that. And I said, have you ever heard of a community foundation? And he said, no, what are those? 
I said, well, there are a lot of community foundations here in Southern California. There's the world's largest called the California Community Foundation. And you can create a fund under the community foundation. You could call it your own name, you know, John Doe Foundation, and it's part of the California Community Foundation. There are restrictions on the kinds of things you can do, but they're pretty, pretty reasonable restrictions. And it took, back then, it only took $10,000 to open a fund. I think it's more now at California. But um, I said, you can open the fund for $10,000. And he said, Hugh, I love this. He said, oh my goodness, I have never heard of one of those. Here, hang on, here's my card. Would you mind, do you know anybody there? Yeah, I know, I know somebody, I know the VP of development. He said, would you introduce me? I said, I'd, be, I'd love to introduce you. That's what networking is. And you can network anywhere, anytime, any place, even in church, if you honor the event. And to me, honoring the event is about making connections with people. And if you can help someone in some way, then that's what networking is. Now, if I'd have called him, he was in a business that wasn't, you know, wasn't relevant to BNI. But if I had wanted to call, if, if I had called him next week and, I, and said, hey, it was great talking to you. Oh, by the way, I introduced him to the VP and he opened up an account like that. If I had called him a week later and said, hey, I'd like to get together with you and learn more about what you do, maybe, do you think he would have taken my call and would he have met with me? Yeah. Why? Because I, because I made the beginning of a relationship. And so uh, we, we stayed connected through, through church. We never did business together, but it, that's what networking is. It's about helping people. And it comes back around to you. That is such a great story. Now, you're, you're, I don't know, your giver's gain. I don't know what that is, is a vision, a motto. That really summarizes B&I. How did you arrive at that? We, we tend to use too many words. And it's yeah. so, so brilliant. It's simplicity, giver's gain. How did you get to that? So, you know, it's really predicated on a theory in social capital called the law of reciprocity. And the law of reciprocity basically is what goes around comes around that, you know, if you put things out to the world, it'll come back to you. And to me, that, that phrase was the simplest way of explaining what could be a somewhat complex concept because the concept of giving, um, is actually more complicated than it sounds because when you really get to it, people then they start asking, well, when do you know that you're giving too much and you're not getting anything in return? And, um, you know, how, how do you, how do you ask? Do you only give, give, give and never ask? So there are, there are subtleties and complexities to the concept of giver's gain, but the bottom line is you have to be willing to give to people before you expect them to give you anything. And giving might be just a referral to someone else, not, not selling your business, but giving them ideas, giving them connections. Well, our reciprocity. Thank you, Napoleon Hill. It's, yeah. it's, it's so, the problem with common sense is it's not very common. It's not commonly applied, yeah. No. <laughs> so, um, I've been doing this kind of work, supporting them. I've worked in the church for 40 years as a music director, and then people thought I was smart because I'd served, you know, 12,000 member church, so they asked me to come do board development or leadership development with them, and uh, so I sort of developed my third career out of, out of that, but um, I, I really struggle with um, how things have changed so dramatically, and the work has gotten more and more important over those last 32 years that I've been doing this work, and it's probably more important now than ever before in history, so in this changed world, in this new normal, it's up to us as leaders to set the bar for the new culture and the new engagement. What are your thoughts about how things have changed and how networking is important in that new time? Well, listen, networking's always been important. Uh, what I've done to it is to try and codify it and organize it, structure it, and explain it in a way that I think is useful for people, but it's always been important. In terms of leadership, I think there, there are a couple of concepts that I was taught by, um, I, I did my doctoral work at USC. I studied under Dr. Warren Bennis, who was in his day, the world's leading expert on leadership. That mantle has been handle, handed over to uh, John C. Maxwell, who, who is an amazing man. I've had an opportunity to meet him on a number of occasions and um, truly uh, holds the crown of the, the, you know, the expert on leadership today. 
But one of the things I learned from Warren when I studied at USC was um, something that I think applies today and will apply 100 years from now in leadership. Two concepts, one is contextual intelligence, and the second is adaptive capacity. So contextual intelligence. And this is something that I don't hear talked about much in leadership, but, it, but Warren talked about it. Um, the, you really need to understand the context of the challenge because the context will determine, at the context and the players will determine uh, elements of how you address a particular challenge. And so you really have to understand the context of this particular problem because the same problem in a different place might not have the same context. It may not play out exactly the same. I'll give you an example. The second thing is adaptive capacity, that one must have the ability to adapt to the changing contextual intelligence that you're confronted with. So he talked about these concepts and I understood them and I saw it come out and, and play out in the real world at the university where I was on the board. And he was speaking, uh, he did a, an event, I invited him to speak at an event at the University of Laverne and, and he came and he spoke. And, it was right before the new president had taken office. And he said to everyone, big audience, he said, what do you guys think of the new president? Um, she's amazing, isn't she? And everyone was like, oh my gosh, she's fantastic. And she was like, cheer. She hadn't started yet, but she'd been on the campus like off and on for more than a month. And he said, "She is she prepared or what? And everyone was like, yeah, she's completely prepared. She's gonna come in, it's gonna be great. He said, from day one, everything's gonna just come into place, isn't it? Yeah. And he leaned into the microphone, he said, you're all crazy. And we were shocked. He said, you're all crazy. She's prepared, yeah. But the, the, the minute she walks in, there are gonna be changes to the environment that nobody predicted. And so her ability to adapt will be critical in the success in her role in this, um, in this, at this university. Well, within 30 days, within 30 to 60 days after she took in, came in, Hugh, uh, the university lost its uh, preliminary or interim accreditation for the Bar Association's law school. Yeah. So she had nothing to do with it, obviously. She'd only been there for a month, less than two. And there was interim accreditation and there was just one more step to get to fully accredited, lost it, completely lost it. She had 60 days to, I mean, she had um, one year to regain interim accreditation or it would be uh, lost permanently. Well, you know, that's, that requires incredible adaptive capacity. It also requires contextual intelligence. The law school was on a track. It was doing fine. So she, you know, she had to understand the, the whole board. She had to see the entire chessboard of the university and see where things were going and what she thought was going to be okay actually wasn't. And so uh, in understanding that, a lot of resources had to go to that. And a lot of adapting had to take place. And that was all part of the leadership process that I think, um, is something that 100 years from now will still be just as important, no matter what the technology, what, no matter what the situation, understanding the context and being able to adapt are key elements of a successful leader. And by the way, university is fully accredited as a law school now, fully accredited. Yeah, yeah. There's the, this um, three feet from gold, as um, Craig Reed writes about, you know, we don't give up because you're, you're right there. I think Edison said, well, most people give up just before they succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, you and I were talking a little bit as we were launching the, the live Facebook feed. And um, we haven't been on airplanes in a while. You know, it's, it's one, people, one person said, we, we really, we're finding out now which meetings could really be held by email instead of having to be there. So I have to tell you, I, I haven't been too sad at canceling some of my trips. Yeah. And so that's a whole new world working from home I miss the interaction and the chemistry of being present, but I'm, I'm just as busy as when I was traveling, maybe more. So why, how do we network from home and how do we work from home and expand? We're, we're in the business, whether it's a church or a nonprofit or 
or a for-profit business. We're in business and we need to have positive cash flow to do our work. So how do we function at home, especially now? Well, first of all, I think uh, the, that we will go back to meeting people in person. Uh, that's not going to completely uh, disappear. I think the genie is out of the bottle a little bit. And what I foresee is some kind of hybrid where you're going to see a lot more done online and a lot done in person. And as you know, with BNI, we're talking about 9,500 in-person meetings every week. So we had to turn on a dime. Uh, we flipped within weeks to 9,500 online meetings. So we now run online meetings. When we are out of, uh, I like you know, to call this the great pause, when we are out of the great pause, I think, um, I think that there will be still some groups that may wanna continue to meet online. But I think that we're probably gonna end up with some kind of hybrid-like uh, uh, system. So in the meantime, while we're working at home, I think there's a number of things that are important to know. First of all, I started BNI out of my house. I have worked from home for most of the last oh, 37, 38 years. Uh, when I had the consulting business, um, I remember going to the, to the city to get a business license. This was in 1983, get a business license for my consulting business. They were like, where's your office? So I work from home. Yeah, you can't get a business license. No, 1983, you could not get a business license. That's not a business, they said. I'm like, well, yeah, I'm a consultant. I, I don't really need an office space. Yeah, you can't have a license. So I could not get a business license for the city because uh, I was working from home. Um, it, things have changed a lot since then. Wow. You know, I, a couple of years later, a couple of years later, by the way, you were able to get a business license. And I started being I, I started it in my home and I've been working from home off and on for the last 37 years. Um, I now, my office is in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, but I work here in Austin, Texas. This is my home office that I'm talking to you from. So there's a number of things that I could recommend to answer your question. First of all, we have to understand that it's, I, I hate the phrase social distancing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank I do. It shouldn't, we need to be more social than ever. It's physical distancing. It's yes. not social distancing. Yes. So um, I believe we need to be more social than ever. So you start with that. Then some of the things that I talk about in working from home is you, you should have a dedicated workspace. And look, I have a nice office. I didn't always have a separate office. Sometimes it was in the corner of the dining room or it was in a bed. You know, I remember when uh, I got kicked out of one bedroom because we, we were about to have a kid, a uh, child. And then I got kicked out of the second bedroom because we were going to have a second child. And so I had to move out in, into uh, an office. But as we grew, then I had office space in my homes. And so I, I've worked from home most of the last 35 years. Have a dedicated workspace, even if it's a corner of a room. Were you going to say something? No, no. I was just wondering how long it took you to figure out why you kept having children. Yeah, I figured that out. And uh, it was it was planned. Uh, we, you know, it was something we wanted. My, my wife, uh, my wife, she was the most amazing um, woman to deal with the pregnancy. She just loved being pregnant. It was, <laughs> it was, uh, it was quite an experience with her. Um, here's another one. Don't get distracted by bright, shiny objects. Yeah. Okay. I keep this here by my desk because I'm always talking to entrepreneurs and they're always chasing bright, shiny objects. And you want to be successful at whatever you're doing, whether it's nonprofit or for profit. Here's an important key. Do six things a thousand times, not a thousand things six times. Ooh. And it doesn't have to be six. It could be five. It could be seven. But do six things a thousand times, not a thousand things six times. And what I see business people do, and even, even nonprofits, is they constantly chase new things rather than really you know, have a program and work it and work it and work it and work it until it becomes successful. If I have any superpower at all as a business person, it is that I am a dog with a bone. I'm, I'm very persistent. And so I'm good doing six things a thousand times. I think people that do that are much more likely to um, be successful. Um, here's a couple of other suggestions in working from home. No, no social media. Now, if it's business, 
you know, if, if, if it's for your nonprofit organization, that's fine. But no cat videos during the middle of the day, okay? They're, they're forbidden. You can't, you know, do, don't, you know, something happens to the space-time continuum when you get on Facebook and you end up on, you know, some YouTube video an hour later and you're like, how did I get here? So stay off of social media unless it's related to your organization. Um, and uh, right now, more than ever, microdose the news. Microdose the news. Yes, I see people that are overdosing on the news. Don't do that. It's so easy to do from home. Don't do it. You'll just all you see is doom and gloom and the end of the world. Um, you know, don't and, and don't get frozen. Last last suggestion. Don't get frozen by fear. Let fear focus you, not put you in a state of fear. Uh, get focused by fear. Don't get frozen by fear. As a performer, I had to learn that. You know, yeah. you get on stage, you got all these people staring at, you. and then you get you turn around, you got a baton, you got seventy five musicians and two hundred singers, and so it's like, ooh, yeah. they're all looking at me. <laughs> so I got to tell you, turn, when Bernie had me speak on stage, that's a whole lot easier than conducting. But you know, people are staring at you, so you have to have a a mind, a whole whole different mindset. Um, and there is uh, believing in self that's really important, no matter what we're doing here. We've got we've got our core values and our guiding principles of how we how we use those those values, and then we've got something worthy. But working on, like um, Jim Rohn used to say, work on yourself harder than you work on your business. So yeah. constantly work on self. So I'm, I'm I can't tell you how how perfectly aligned everything you've talked about today is what we teach in Center Vision, and I'm so happy. It, it, what I've come to call what we're doing now is anti-social distancing. I don't know what brilliant person came up with the term, but thank you. It is, it is physical distancing. Right. We're more social than we have been before. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah I've got a blog on that. So it, I just, yeah. So we got some people watching here. If you got a question, raise your hand or type it in to the, to the uh, chat panel. We're, I, uh, we're coming to you live today in Facebook uh, from Texas and Virginia. I'm in, um, Central Western Virginia, you know, those bumps we call the Appalachian Mountains, yeah. which are lovely this time of year. And Ivan is in Austin, Texas with a big T. And he's given us lots of bites of wisdom today. We will have this transcribed and you can find it uh, wherever you get podcasts starting um, Sunday after this. And you're probably listening to this maybe today during the, the isolation we have semi-quarantine, whatever we call this. The, pause. the great pause. The great pause. It's like in music, you have the GP, a grand pause. Mm. <laughs> and we, it's, it's a really, when I, I teach my leadership principles and one of them is value the rest. That's the fourth principle, which makes everything else work. And mm. there's rest in music for a purpose. And just, it's not absence of sound, it's, it's a clarity place. Yeah. And I'm finding this is a great time for clarity. Um, it, you got that, where's that? Shiny thing. It's a that's a that's a jewel. It's, that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, I, I don't re I don't even remember where I got it, but uh, as soon as I saw it, I was like, I gotta have that. You're under my control. Watch this. So <laughs> people ask me, you now nonprofit leaders or entrepreneurs, we're social entrepreneurs. And we ought to all be social engineers because we do something that's got the triple bottom line, people, planet, and profit. But people ask me, do you, all you entrepreneurs suffer from insanity? I say, heck no, we enjoy it. <laughs> there is this certain possibility mindset that we have and, and we have this vision. So it's really important. And, and the stuff you talk about leadership, I quote John Maxwell and, and Venice, um, I quote them in, in my writings and my books and my, my, uh, my online courses. So working at home is sort of the new normal and the new normal going forward is going to be a hybrid. But many of our, our, our for purpose social benefit community charities have to be out there feeding people. I'm in Lynchburg, Virginia. We have the highest per capita poverty, poverty in the Commonwealth of Virginia. It's like 25%. So we have 28 agencies that feed people. And so it's really important for them to network amongst themselves, which they're not really doing. So there's a, there's a space for us to learn learn about networking that that's so critical and you know it comes from leadership nothing happens without leadership so I really I do quote John Maxwell a lot um, so there is network a verb and there's network a noun and um, 
Bob's got a question. Let me let Bob talk. Uh, Bob Hopkins from Dallas, Texas. Uh, why don't you ask your question in person? Okay. Hi, Ivan. Bob Hopkins here. And by the way, that picture that you see was 40 years ago. So um, I'm an old man like you. I have white hair. <laughs> hey, I'm just glad I have hair. I don't care that it's white. I'm just glad I still have it. I have lots of it too. Thank you very much. I'm a college professor. I teach in Dallas. I taught at UTA for uh, about 10 years and, and now I'm teaching junior colleges. I teach speech communications and I teach networking. Yeah, but do you have, what I meant by it, let me clarify my statement, because there's usually not full-time professors on these webinars. Um, let me clarify my statement. I only know of one university in the United States, only one, that has a core curriculum, university course on business networking. And that's the University of Michigan, taught by Dr. Wayne Baker. It's the only university in the United States. Now, do teachers talk about networking during a class? Yeah. But I think they teach mostly the wrong stuff, not necessarily the right stuff. But there are no courses on networking to speak of in the world. I know that. Yeah. And that's why, because I think networking is so important because I wouldn't be where I am or have done what I've done if it hadn't been for who I knew. And of course, I tell my students, it's not what you know, it's who you know. But we have this- Ah, wait, 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 wait. wait I, gotta, I gotta, let me add to that. I don't think it's what you know or who you know. It's how well you know each other that counts. Because the question is, do I know that person well enough that I could pick up the phone, call them, would they take my call? And if I ask them for a favor, would they be willing to do the favor? And so it's not just knowing somebody, it's knowing them well. That's the key. Okay. I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you, I'll stop. Well, the rest of the story is then I'm gonna have them write 250 people that they know down to, whittle it down to 25 people that are in their circle of influence. Yeah. That they re can rely on and that they do know and that they consider their mentors and people who are their counselors and people who are their parents maybe and grandparents, et cetera, et cetera. And then they have to write them a letter. And the letter is, you know, I love you so much, or I care about you so much for our relationship, et cetera, et cetera. I want us to continue this, and I want to have your back and you have mine, but I just want you to know you're in my circle of influence. So what you just said is truly right. But I do like this, what you said, how, how well do I know these people? And I think that is the important thing. But my question is, why not? Why are we not teaching this? Why are, does the academia... Yeah. Uh, is it because they have never been in business and they don't know the importance of it? Oh, I'm glad you said it. Uh, I, but that, yeah, that's my answer. I, do, are you a full-time professor or are you an adjunct? I'm adjunct. Okay, so then you know, and I was an adjunct professor for 16 years. Um, you know that it's the full-time tenured professors that control the curriculum. Even the president of the university does not control the curriculum. It's the full-time tenured professors of the university. And so when you're talking about business professors, it's the full-time tenured professors that determine the, the, the classes. Most, and this is what makes, I, I, I really get hate mail when I say this, but most full-time tenured professors in business have never run a business. I know. And, and that's why, that's why you, you can get a bachelor's degree in marketing and not know how to sell. Yeah. Because we don't teach sales techniques. Right. Most business professors, it's like, heaven forbid that I should get my hand dirty and make a sale. Mm -hmm. uh, so they love social media. They'll teach social media. They'll love advertising because you don't have to get your hands dirty and sell. So they don't teach sales, closing sales, business networking. And it's because it's taught mostly by full-time uh, tenured professors. W Wayne Baker is like the only exception I have ever seen in the last 30 years in Michigan. Well, the reason I'm here is because Hugh and I've connected because um, I ran nonprofit organizations for 35 years before I started teaching college. So I've only been teaching for about 10 years, but the nonprofit sector is something I also teach, philanthropy. I have a book called Philanthropy Misunderstood. I have my students know philanthropy, but I was called by my dean at one of these universities who said to me, Bob, nonprofits are not businesses. Why are you teaching nonprofits in your classroom? Oh my, oh my. So, so um, Ivan, I don't know if you could see my screen or not. This is Bob's book. 
uh, Philanthropy Misunderstood. Oh, yeah, nice. And it's, it's, it's a brilliant book. And there are um, world-changing, life-changing uh, nonprofits. And he's had a long yeah. career of being very well, Bob, I agree with you, by the way. I, I, think, uh, I think the lessons learned in business and in nonprofits are, are oftentimes, at the very least, overlapping, if not the same. Well, I was excited to know who you are and that you're the one who founded networking. Thank you. Well, I can't, I'm not, <laughs> I, I, I founded BNI, but uh, you know, networking has been around for a long time. I, I kind of uh, organized it. So Bob, Bob, um, uh, thank you for coming in. Um, let me, let me prevail upon your, your secrecy there. Tell him the name of your horse before you leave. Well, that horse there is, is uh, not the one that I have now, but the one I have now is named Philanthropy. Oh, I like it. He's yeah. all in. So, Bob, thank you so much for letting me bring you. Bob, in. it's good talking to you. Thanks for sharing your uh, your knowledge. I'm in Dallas, and I w once the, this settles down and the traffic isn't too bad, I'm going to drive to Austin to meet you. All right, you got it. Okay, thank you, Bob. Be well. Bob's a, Bob's a peach of a guy, and I I went to Dallas. My wife's a clergy graduate of, of Perkins School of Theology, and we were going before a week before the, the airlines quit taking us places, and. So, and I had guests that had founded a, a Barefoot Winery. And they said, oh, you gotta meet Bob. So we connected <laughs> and have, have been doing some amazing stuff since then. So that's I'm networking. Never, we're coming up, yes, networking, yeah. Um, they accidentally founded a winery. They were marketing people, it's a great story. Oh, wow. I've had some wonderful and wonderful people in six years on, on the show. And you're giving us really useful, helpful nuggets. So this is oh, so good. You. Uh, to find out about BNI, you go to BNI, Business Networking International dot com. Yeah. And Ivan Meisner dot com, I V A N M I S N E R dot com. Right. Ivan Meisner dot com. Um, I've got, oh, you know, 13 years of content up there. It's all free. Check it out. Love it. Ivan is the, is the man. He's been such an influencer um, over, over those many years. So, um, Talk about the difference between network as a verb and network as a noun. Well, how would you define it? Well, having a network are people who, who you've done the due diligence with. You have a relationship, you know who they are. Um, I spent 40 years in church ministry, music ministry, and I never had lunch alone. I always mm -hmm. met with somebody and I got the most useful information and they got information because they'd ask me questions about what do you do anyway? We see you for an hour on Sunday. What do you do the rest of the week? When they, I realized the Baloo 1090 rule is 10% is what you see, 90%, and this is true of any business, is, is what you don't see that makes that 10% possible. Yeah. So networking is an activity to connect and meet people and to share and to provide value for people. And a network is a people who you know. So what do you think? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good definition. Um, both of them are really, if it's done right, it's about relationship building. It's about the relationships that you create. Yeah, here's, absolutely, absolutely. And leadership is based on relationship. Communication is founded in relationship. Yeah. The flow of money is founded based Oftentimes, in relationship. Oftentimes, yeah, in money, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so but let's talk about something that's not money flow. Let's talk about boards. Now I'm just, um, I'm going off of being the president of the Lynchburg Symphony Orchestra Board and I was a guest conductor and they, they elected me when I wasn't looking at, to be president. So I'm going off and we're doing this, this board nomination process. So this is, this is networking also and we don't know how to make the ask for money or for people. And you know, I love it when people say, oh, would you serve on this committee <clears> of <throat> this board? It's not a lot of work. Well, you know, they're lying to you. <laughs> so, so how do we how do we come forward? You've been on boards. It's maybe hard to get the right people on the board. How do we how do we frame the conversation when we want to invite people to consider a board position? Well, I think the first thing you do is um, you go to them with someone who knows them really well. Ooh. If that's you, that's great. But otherwise, um, I think the the. See, the, the power, the third party testimonial is incredibly powerful. And when you have somebody who, who says, um, you know, let's say there's a third person here. Let's say Bob is talking to us and Bob says to me, um, uh, Ivan, you really should be active in Hugh's organization. Uh, and Hugh, 
Uh, Hugh has done an amazing job. He's created this organization that's done this thing and this thing. And you know what, that, that should resonate with you because you're interested, you know, my, my emphasis on nonprofits tends to be children and education. Because I, I believe children represent about 20% of the, today's population, but they represent 100% of the future. And so it's about children and educating them. And so if, if, you know, if he can make that linkage, then he has connected the two of us. And then we can have that dialogue about how I might be able to help you or you might be able to help me. So I think the third party endorsement process is the best way to get donors. It's the best way to get board members, committee members. Um, you know, it's easier for me to say no, no to somebody I don't know, trust or like, than it is to say no to somebody I know, trust and like. Ah, uh, point well taken. That's, that's really good sage advice. I, um, I can see why you've been <clears throat> very successful, <clears throat> very successful over the years. Um, starting a business, growing a business and maintaining the viability of a business are three different things, aren't they? Oh yeah, um, very much so. I think um, that an entrepreneur needs to figure out pretty quickly or even in a nonprofit, when you're in that nonprofit in whatever role, if you want to be happy with what you do, it's very important that you work in your flame and not in your wax. Mm. Let me explain that. When you're working in your flame, you're, you're excited, you're on fire. People can hear it in the way you speak, they can see it in the way you act. When you're working in your wax, you know, it just takes all your energy away and people can hear it in your voice and they can see it in the way you act. And so um, over time, the things that are your flame, I mean, let me speak for myself. The things that were my flame when I started BNI are no longer my flame. You know, many of those things, I, I don't want to do them anymore. And so uh, it's very important to learn the skill set of how to delegate effectively, how to select the right people, delegate effectively, put them in charge of that area so that you can continue to work in your flame and not in your wax. And I work in my flame. 90% of my time is in my flame. I mean, this is the fourth interview I've done today. So, you know, I'm sort of the Colonel Sanders of BNI now, you know, this is, I'm the spokesman for networking. Love it, love it. We, we're, we've got just a couple minutes left. Tell us about your nonprofit that you founded. Well, I uh, started the uh, Meisner Charitable Foundation and the BNI Foundation. So there are two different foundations that uh, we've created. <laughs> Both focus on children and education. And the uh, Meisner Family Foundation is a, is a private uh, foundation for my family, uh, supporting children in education. And the BNI Foundation also primarily supports children in education. And it's part of really, it's the charitable arm of what BNI does. And we've, um, uh, we, we do both uh, activities to help uh, kids locally, as well as, you know, funding uh, grants and things like that locally. So BNI, BNIfoundation.org, you can find the website for that foundation. Love it, BNIfoundation.org. Yeah. Um, so think about um, a closing thought. I'm gonna do a sponsor moment here. Think about a closing thought or a tip or a challenge that you'd like to give people that are listening to this. And it could be years from now. We've been doing these interviews for six years, uh, Ivan. It's, we've had some incredible people. So our, our sponsor today is EZ Card, a letter E, letter Z card. And here is, this looks funny on the computer, but on your phone, it fills up the frame. So um, easy card is a, is a way to network digitally so you know how to get together physically. So if you send a text to the number 64600 with the, with the letter LDR, three letters, LDR, you'll get something that looks like this, a, a link and you push on it, nothing to download, but you'll have the work about Center Vision Leadership Foundation and you'll see right here the nonprofit exchange videos, and you'll get to see today's session up here by later today. So it's an archive of all the shows we've done. Look at there. Here's the spot for, for BNI. So have Center Vision. It's a community for community builders. It's a place for peer-to-peer -peer networking. We share with each other. We help each other, and people across the country can say, oh, 
I know somebody that you need to meet and I'll introduce you. So easy card is the way for you to stay in touch with your, your tribe, your donors, your board yeah. members, anybody, your volunteers. So check out the easy card by looking at Center Vision Leadership Foundation's easy card. Text the word, the letters LDR to the number 64600. Ivan Meisner, I don't know why you said yes, but I'm glad you did for coming on my show today. It was on LinkedIn. We had this short exchange and you were like, okay, I'll do it. Sure. So what do you want to, what thought or challenge or tip do you want to leave people with today? Well, I think, um, you know, we're living through obviously challenging times and I don't know what our future holds, but I do know we can influence it. I do know we can make a difference in it. And I also know that your mindset is so incredibly important. And I think that hope is much more powerful than fear. Fear paralyzes us. It freezes us. And when we're afraid of what the future will hold or what's going to happen, we just freeze. And what we need to do right now more than ever is focus, not freeze, but focus. And that focus can come with hope. The only other thing you need to add to it is action. You have hope and you take action. And when you do those things, you can come out of times like this and, and you can make it through, through times like this. Be creative, be innovative. Think about what you can do. My, my nonprofit, the, the Austin Boys and Girls Club that I'm on the board of, they created a, something called Club on the Go where you can come by and pick up food uh, that they package so that there's so, still that social distancing. So be creative, have hope and influence your future. That's my Meister, closing really thoughts. your gift to all of us. Thank you for being on the Not Public Exchange today.